This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Hey, Jason, just wanted to send you a quick message of gratitude. I'm so grateful that I got into the game and got in with properties that make sense because the rent income keeps coming in. So thank you. Glad we connected. And I'm glad to be in the income property game instead of the Wall Street game for my future. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Hey, it's Jason Hartman, and thank you for joining me today as we talk about the ultimate subscription business income property, (laughs) the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. Our guest today on the show will be Rick Sharga. He is a returning guest who has been here before. He's been back several times. He's going to share some awesome insights with you today on the housing market, where it's been, where it is now, and most importantly, where it is going. You're going to be surprised at some of these insights, so stay tuned for that. Aren't you glad that you aren't investing in some of these big REITs, real estate investment trusts, these big deals, because you'd probably have your money locked up? Yep, (laughs) that's what's happening. We reported on this a few times over the past several months. We talked about Blackstone, et cetera, and look at this. Negative 45%, this is from the Wall Street Journal, negative 45%, how much the total returns of shares in office real estate investment trusts, including dividends, are down in the last year, in the last year. Now, office properties, definitely not a place you want to be. I will say that again with the same disclaimer I always use, which is, You can make money in lots of areas of real estate. Of course, there are always ways to make money. But by and large, the macro trend, even before the pandemic, was the decline of the need of office space. I predicted this back in 2004, back in 2004. So 18 years ago, 19 years ago, I was predicting this exact thing. And before that, back in the 90s, I was predicting the decline of retail properties. I just knew this internet thing would matter. Even back then, when Amazon was just born, (laughs) and, and, you know, there used to be another big company that they thought would take over the world, but they didn't take over the world. And that was buy.com. Anybody remember buy.com? And then people actually thought Barnes and Noble back in the day was a competitor for Amazon. I remember back in 1999, when I published my first book on branding and relationship marketing and so forth, because uh, everybody for so many years had told me I was really good at that stuff. I ought to write a book. So I got a book out there back in 1999. And I remember having to fulfill the orders, right? And I'd get an email from Amazon. They would make it very easy to print a shipping label and send them the books in a box, right? I'd send them a box, you know, listen, this book was no big deal, folks. It was never any big success, but it was interesting because I saw the way the two companies worked. So Amazon would send me an email, I'd print a mailing label, stick it on the box, send it in, it was so simple. Barnes and Noble would send me a stupid fax. I kid you not, do you remember fax machines? Yes, (laughs) hey, it was better than nothing, but certainly not 
better than email and the internet. And so they'd send me this. And, you know, I just got tired of filling the orders with, with Barnes and Noble. It was such a hassle. I just gave up on Barnes and Noble and just shipped all my books to Amazon and said, forget about it. It's not even worth the hassle. So I predicted the decline of retail properties back in the 90s. No one was talking about that then. I predicted the decline of office space and the decline of industrial properties. However, the industrial properties, and I don't know a lot about industrial properties. I'll be the first to admit I'm no expert, at least not yet. I've just never been extremely interested in that space in the real estate market. I've always been interested in housing. Housing is where it's at. Everybody needs a place to live. So what did I say back then, 19 years ago? Hey, if you went to my seminars back then, you would have heard me say this. I had a slide on this in my PowerPoint slide deck, and it said they can outsource the need for office space to India and the Philippines, call centers, software development, all that kind of stuff, office space, right? That's office space. So that they can outsource to India and the Philippines, which they certainly have, right? They can outsource the need for industrial properties to China mostly, the workshop of the world. Now I get that there's a deglobalization trend going on, so the tide is shifting, no question about it. And they can outsource the need for retail properties to the internet. And that has all happened. Every single one of those predictions I made came true long before anybody was saying this stuff. Now, I'm sure there were a couple of people saying it, but it's a figure of speech. Okay, nobody in the mainstream was saying that stuff back then when I was saying it. They cannot outsource the need for housing. As long as we don't see a decline in population, and with all this stuff that everybody's been talking about the past few years, I can't even mention the word that starts with a V or J for the thing in the arm, you know, that everybody got. Sadly, that is a real concern. Yes, I know. Some are still calling it a wacko conspiracy theory, but some are willing to look at it as a possibility, a scary possibility about the elite attempt to reduce the population. Do you remember, did you ever see, and I saw it with my own eyes back in, we'll say circa 2006, approximately, that TED Talk with Mr. Gates, Yes, the multi, multi billionaire, Mr. Gates, who used to be the richest man in the world. He said about 27 minutes into that talk, it was a long TED talk that I'm sure this has been sanitized from the internet by now. I can't imagine it's still up. You know, of course, the, the powers that be, the thought police would take it down by now, right? But he literally said, and some said, well, it was just a slip of the tongue. He said, if we can reduce the population through, and I don't want to say the V word, But yeah, he said that I saw that video and that was long before we could do, you know, deep fakes with video right now. Now we can do that. Now you never know if something is on video, if it's really true, certainly not on audio on audio. That's super easy to fake, but video is now really easy to fake. Can you imagine how this changes the legal system? I mean, what if you have a video of someone committing a crime, right? How do you know it's really them? The deep fakes are so good now that a video is no longer evidence anymore. I mean, it's so easy to do that. You can just look it up. You can you can make a deep fake of someone saying something on a video or doing something on a video, and it's not really them. Super, super scary stuff. But anyway, back to that was a tangent tangent alert. Forgive me on the tangent alert there. I I did not alert you to the tangent in advance, but it was a tangent. Anyway, yeah, aren't you glad you are concentrating on direct investment and you're in housing, the thing people need the most housing? You cannot outsource the place to live as long as there's not a decline in population. You're looking good. That There will be little ups and downs along the way. I get it, but the overall macro trend cannot be denied that you're going to make money. At least you're going to outperform everybody else in all the other asset classes, right? 
I can't imagine you could possibly lose on that. Okay, let's move on. So I showed you this chart before. And for those listening on audio only, I'm showing a chart that shows that 20, basically like 24 point something, it's rounded. Okay, almost 25% of the country has a mortgage at 3% or lower. And 65% of the country has a mortgage at 4% or lower. These people are not under distress or pressure to sell. Yeah, there's a little bit of a bump in the foreclosure rate, but it's still virtually nothing. It's just virtually nothing. So that's one chart I've shown you, but I got a new chart. It's an important one. And this is it. Housing equity bubble 2.0, the chart is entitled. Now this is from a group that is selling Wall Street assets, saying you should invest in the stock market, right? But it's interesting, that's the title of the chart, but the data on the chart is actually quite positive. It doesn't show that. Am I reading this wrong? I mean, I looked at it several times. I looked at it from different angles. I stood up and I looked down on my screen. I went to the side and looked sideways. I went to the right and the left. I moved my head down and looked up at the chart. It seemed to be saying the same thing. (laughs) Obviously, I'm kidding, right? But you got to look at things from different angles. That's an important thing in life, right? Got to understand things from different narratives and different angles. But housing owners equity in real estate, right? That has jumped dramatically. I mean, going back to that other chart about the low mortgage rates, well, what that doesn't show you is that 40% of the homes in America are free and clear. They have no mortgage. It's pretty hard to get into distress when you don't have any mortgage. It's pretty hard to get into distress and become a extremely motivated distress seller who's got to dump their property when your mortgage is below 3% or below 4%, like 65% of the entire country's mortgages. Now, look at the equity. There is a massive amount of equity versus mortgage debt. I mean, it's really like this is a healthy situation, folks. Yet the name of the chart is Housing Equity Bubble 2.0. Uh, I don't know. You know, what can you make of this stuff? Look, for more on this stuff, join us at Empowered Investor Live. It's coming right up. So we're looking forward to seeing you. Ken McElroy, Sharon Lecter, Rudyard Lynch, Tom Wheelwright, George Gammon by Satellite, Joe Brown with Heresy Financial. We added another speaker talking about asset protection. We got a great attorney talking about that. And we've got a fun event, but it's also a mindset event because we're going to have a little uh, stage hypnotist as well. That's on Friday evening after the cocktail reception. He said he didn't mind if you have a drink or two beforehand. It would actually make it more educational and more fun. So that's going to be a great time. And then Saturday night, we have a great band. I'm really excited about the band we have. They're going to play all sorts of great hits. So you can dance the night away with us on Saturday. And just don't party too hard because we need you on your A game Sunday morning because there's going to be a lot more learning on Sunday. So two and a half day event, Scottsdale, Arizona. Go to jasonhartman.com, grab your tickets, or if you want to go directly to the ticket site, empoweredinvestor.com slash live. This is going to be a great event. And lastly, I just want to remind you, because several of you have asked about this, our upcoming cruise for our Empowered Investor Pro members. Not a member? Don't worry. You can get your cruise tickets and join at the same time. You really got to be an Empowered Investor Pro and join us. You'll have an investment counseling session with me at sea, and that'll be great in a casual environment. We'll be on the cruise ship. We'll be wearing t-shirts and shorts and talking about your investments and your portfolio and your future and enjoying that. So it's going to be a great time. This is a small event. We're just expecting a very small number of people. Maybe, you know, we'll have 10 people. It's going to be small and casual. This is not a conference. It's not a seminar. It's us going on vacation together. But we will not miss an investment counseling session for each and every attendee. The link to register for the cruise is empoweredinvestor.com slash cruise. That's empoweredinvestor.com slash cruise. That's a five-day cruise on one of the largest cruise ships in the entire world, in the Western Caribbean, 
will leave and arrive back in Miami. So it's really, really easy. And we're looking forward to seeing you there. Empoweredinvestor.com slash cruise. You do have to be a pro member, but you can join pro, which you should join anyway, because we have such great monthly Zoom meetings and we've got a social networking forum, a private forum for all of our pro members. And of course, big discounts on our live events, which you have already taken advantage of probably because you're attending and we'll see you in Scottsdale. Okay, without further ado, let's get to our guest. Let's get to returning guest, Rick Sharga, as we talk about the market and some very important insights. So here we go. It is my pleasure to welcome a returning guest back to the show, and that is none other than Rick Sharga. He's with Adam Data Solutions. They are a leading provider of data to the real estate industry, and they've got a lot of stuff to share with us today. Rick has some good visual aids. If you're watching this on video, if you're just listening on audio for the podcast, we will endeavor to explain them to you, but you can always see the visuals on uh, YouTube or the other video platforms if you like. Rick, welcome back. How are you? Jason, great to be here. Thank you for inviting me again. Always enjoy our conversations. Me too. It's always great to have you. And Rick, I got to tell you, a lot of people that have been running around like Chicken Little for the last couple of years saying the sky is falling, they actually think they're right now. And I still think they're wrong. <laughs> what do you I, think? I, uh, Jason, I, you and I are on the same page. Um, it's It's impossible to ignore the fact that home sales have plummeted. Uh, strictly strictly an affordability issue, we'll, we'll get into that as we, we go through the, the visual aids you mentioned a few minutes ago, but it's not because of lack of demand, it's not because the underlying fundamentals of the housing market have changed, it's strictly because we've seen something happen that we have never seen before in history, yeah. which is mortgage rates have doubled in a calendar year. And yeah. That simply doesn't give the market a chance to adjust. But the people that have been calling for a market crash and prices plummeting and huge foreclosure waves, they're still selling uh, basically uh, crazy sauce. I, I would encourage all of the, the viewers and listeners to avoid those people like the plague uh, because the end results won't be any more pleasant. There are many important distinctions that we'll talk about today, but one of them that you said right off, you know, it's impossible to not notice that uh, sales have plummeted. Listen carefully to what Rick said, folks. He's talking about volume of transactions. Right. He didn't say prices. Now, prices are softening, but even that is very uneven. And we can talk about that. What's What's been fascinating to me, and I predicted this quite a while back, is that there's this dichotomy between the new home sales market and the resale market because developers don't have long-term debt at the lowest interest rates in 5,000 years, quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they don't have 28 to 29 years left on that super cheap debt, like resale existing homeowners do. And so they're motivated and they're the builders. You do see the new home prices. I'll put it this way. There's a lot more motivation on the builder but side. You're, you're, you're hitting on something that, uh, and, and to your credit, you're one of the few people I've talked to in the last six months who gets that. Yeah. Uh, but you're talking about something I've been out talking about for a while right now. The new home market is much more sensitive to these kind of price swings yeah. and interest rate swings than the existing home market. If you're a current homeowner sitting on a two and a half, three percent mortgage, you're not terribly anxious to list that property, buy something more expensive. Uh, and, and in a declining market, by the way, or a flat market from a pricing perspective, and then take on a, a new mortgage at six and a half or seven percent. And, so and, and Rick, be, yeah. before you go on, if I just may interject, that person, that avatar that you just mentioned, that mm -hmm. homeowner with the two and a half or three percent mortgage that's not anxious to sell their home and take on a six percent mortgage, right? That's twenty five percent of the country. It's that's actually twenty five percent. It's actually bigger. Oh, it uh, is. Go ahead. If, if you look at existing mortgage holders, uh, yeah. so it's, you know, forget about the people that own their home outright. But if you look right. at current mortgages, uh, about uh, between 60 and 70% of them have a, an interest rate of 4% or lower. 
That that I know. Sixty five percent is four percent or lower. Yep. I was doing three percent or lower right. is twenty five percent. So we're we're both on the same page there. Yep. And then of course the free and clear homes are forty percent of the market. Yep. So yep. like you got to show me a distressed homeowner. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the only people who are going to sell right now are people who have to sell. And then yeah. there'll be two categories. There'll be people who are in distress. Uh, and, and by the way, our data shows that 93% of homeowners in foreclosure have positive equity in their homes, which yeah. which most people wouldn't believe, but it, it's true. Or they're going to be people whose, whose personal or, or family situation has changed significantly enough that they're going to have to venture out into this market, even though it's not optimal from, from a seller's perspective. So that's going to keep existing home sales inventory relatively low. Builders, to your point, if you're Toll Brothers or Polte or some other home builder, oh. you have three, four properties at the end of a development that are sitting there vacant. You haven't you're sold You're going to cut deals. Yeah, because they're costing you money every month. And yeah, it's a very right. different uh, mindset, very different scenario. The other thing I'd point out, and I'm not sure how you feel about this, but I, I do believe we're going to see new home sale prices come down, but I don't think it's because today's five hundred thousand dollar house is going to sell for three hundred and fifty thousand. I think the builders are going to adjust and build less expensive properties to begin with because they've seen the market condition shift. So it's not like you're going to be getting a great deal on a, a really a big new home that that should have been more expensive. You're going to be getting a market price deal on a on a smaller or less expensive home because the builders know that you can't afford that that more expensive property. Right. The only thing, though, is it takes quite a while for that shift in construction to happen for those home builders, though, right? It, it, it takes a while, but we've seen home builders stop. Uh, the, the housing starts have dropped double digits on a year over year basis for, I think, four months in a row now. Yeah. Um, and so when we see them restart, I think they'll restart at, at basically smaller, less expensive yeah. properties. Totally agree. Totally agree with you. Okay, well, let's dive into some of the specifics, the data. You've got some phenomenal charts and graphs I want to look at. So please uh, share them. Feel free to share your screen and uh, let's take a deep dive. Yeah, Jason, we're going to we're going to start with uh, taking a look at the U.S. economy, because that really is the underpinning for for everything that we're going to see uh, going forward in the, in the housing market. And, and you should be seeing a screen that talks about the GDP now. Yep. So um, there's been a lot of questions about whether or not we've been in a recession. I'm in the camp that says that even though we saw two consecutive negative quarters of GDP growth, gross domestic product growth for anybody who's curious, and that technically is the definition of a recession. I don't believe we were in one. Um, the, the, the negative growth was really just at the margins. A lot of that was caused uh, by, by some of the ongoing disruption from COVID and by a reduction, candidly, in government spending. Uh, and we we came out of that in in the third quarter with uh, almost three uh, percent year over year uh, growth in terms of the GDP. Um, we're anticipating a, a positive fourth quarter, although just barely positive. Um, but but the bottom line here is if you're looking at gross domestic product, which is what most economists look at as sort of the 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 bellwether stat when it comes to whether we're in a recession, whether we're growing or or, or declining. The numbers actually are, are pretty good right now, uh, relative to where they were a couple of quarters. And and again, not really looking like we were in a recession because all the other aspects of the economy were doing very well. One of those uh, is employment. And and Jason, this is the most remarkable uh, unemployment to full employment recovery we've seen in history. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we we peaked at about 14% unemployment. We lost 22 million jobs overnight wow. when the government shutdown happened. That's um, shocking. In two years, we recovered all of those jobs. Uh, if, if you go back to the Great Recession, the last big recession we had, unemployment peaked at about 11%, so it wasn't quite as high. And it took us a full decade to recover all those jobs, uh, 10 years to recover the jobs as opposed to two years this time. The other thing that was very different about this cycle was a lot of the job losses were focused in one segment of the economy. They were the service sector. Yep. So retail, restaurants, uh, trans transportation, travel, hospitality, entertainment, those markets really took a major hit. Everybody else kind of stayed fully employed. Um, and and so one of the reasons the housing market didn't take more of a hit is because those industries 
by and large have employees who are renters. So the, the rental market was a little bit more at risk during this uh, this downturn than, than the, the housing market from an owner-occupied standpoint. But you see that our unemployment rates, whether you're looking at short-term or continuing claims, are back down to where they were prior to the pandemic. I think the most recent report, we were at something like 3.7% unemployment. Uh, that's up a little bit from uh, recent numbers, but that's that's actually not bad news because it shows that um, we've actually had more people re-enter the workforce. Uh, yeah. So that that made the numbers tick up a little bit. So even what looks like it might be negative actually is positive. And in fact, there's still about 10 million open jobs and about 6 million people looking for work. So a very unusual set of circumstances that we're seeing in the jobs market. Um, you and I, you and I can be a little bit cynical about data sometimes, and so we, we've seen, uh, we've seen the administration talk about job growth, and and you and I both know that a lot of the quote unquote job growth are, are really jobs being replaced from the ones that were lost during the recession. So some of this is new jobs, some of it isn't new jobs, but the bottom line, as I said, is we still have about ten million jobs looking uh, for for employees, and about six million employees looking for work. That's put pressure on hiring managers uh, to to raise wages. So wage growth uh, has been pretty steady and pretty strong for the last couple of years. And that's important from a housing market perspective. Um, we talk about affordability. People always focus on home prices. Uh, there's really three legs to that stool. One is home prices. Uh, another is, is interest rates. We will talk more about that. And third is wages. So wages for the first time in many years are actually growing faster than home prices. So that's that's good news. And if wage growth continues to be reasonably stable sometime in 2023, it, it will start to actually have a positive effect on affordability. Okay, so so wages are growing faster than home prices. Uh, so that's a good catch up. But when you add into the mix the Fed and the interest rates, it's not as good as that. But you know, you know, Rick, one of the things that is just really getting my goat, <laughs> to use an old expression, is when people make these comparisons, you know, one of the things that I always say, it sort of become a, a saying on my show and the listeners dub it the Jason Hartman question, I always say, compared to what? Right. Compared to what, right? That's the question. And so many people are making comparisons now on everything in the economy, the real estate market, whatever, to two years ago. And that's not a benchmark. It's not a fair yeah. benchmark. That was such an anomaly, the COVID era, that we can't use it as a yeah. as a comparison point. You can compare things to 2018, 2016, sure, 2008, if you want, whatever, but don't compare it to the COVID era. It's just not a valid comparison. Yeah. No, don't don't do 2008 either. We can do a whole, we can do a whole other segment on on the differences yeah. between 08 and, and where we are oh, now. Oh, sure we can, sure we can. No, that's what a lot of the YouTube crazy people are talking about. Oh, it's the next great recession. It's great. You know, it's like no, uh, but but yeah, you'll you'll hear me refer a lot pre pandemic, uh, and and I, I I agree with you. And in fact, we're still seeing pandemic based volatility in in the data today. So it it it's 2020 you can throw out. Uh, 2021 was kind of a recovery year. Uh, I tend to go back to 2019 uh, prior to the pandemic as the last quote unquote relatively normal year for housing. Um, but yeah, you could go back to 2018, 2017. But but you can't look at 2020. You have to kind of throw those numbers out. Yeah, um, I agree. I mentioned the GDP earlier, and it's important for people to understand about 65 to 70 percent of the gross domestic product uh, is based on consumer spending. And you want to talk about uh, 2020 throwing things out of whack. This this chart looks at uh, consumer sentiment versus consumer spending. And historically, those two have gone hand in hand. When consumer sentiment is strong, consumer spending is strong. Uh, when consumer sentiment dipped during the, the pandemic, we saw consumer spending really, really drop. Uh, and that was partly because of consumer confidence, partly because there just wasn't much we could spend money on. Um, and as consumer confidence started to come back up, so did consumer spending. But for the last year, year and a half, we've seen a huge disconnect because consumer confidence has hit all-time lows and consumer spending has continued to be really, really strong. In fact, stronger uh, than it was prior to the pandemic. So what and, do you make of that, Rick? Why, well, why is there such a disconnect? 
So I, I think a lot of it has to do with government stimulus um, and, and pent up demand. So consumer spending actually dropped uh, way, way lower than consumer confidence did during the pandemic. Uh, we couldn't buy things. We couldn't find things to buy. The supply chains were disrupted. So I think there's been a lot of pent up demand, people buying things they couldn't find a couple of years ago. And the government candidly overstimulated the economy. Uh, an economist friend of mine has a great phrase for it. He said the government took a $3 trillion hole and stuffed $15 trillion into it. So consumers- Say, say that again. Say that I said again. the government took a $3 trillion hole and stuffed $15 trillion into it. <laughs> That's a good one. So, so basically, they their their overreaction was five x about yeah they between. five x overreacted. And you know, I just remember hearing Jerome Powell over and over, like we're gonna do whatever we have to. We're not worried about inflation. Yada yada. I mean, he was so accommodative. I couldn't believe it. I mean, in the darkest days, I felt like, okay, I'm glad we have Powell. But after we were coming out of it and he just kept using the word transitory, I thought, this guy is smoking crack. You know, he's, he's just wrong. You know? Yeah. Well, they, they've ignored the fact that during the pandemic, they increased the monetary supply by 50%. When you have 50% more money floating around, you're going to have inflation. Yeah. Um, and it was exacerbated by the supply chain disruption, which led to product scarcity, right. which led to increased prices. Uh, and then it was exacerbated uh, at least temporarily by the war in Ukraine, which threw everything else into, into question and, yeah. and increased volatility. But the, the chairman has admitted that they whiffed on, on the notion of inflation being transitory and they waited too long to get started. And that's oh, yeah. going to have some, some consequences down the road. The consumer spending has also had an impact on consumer credit use. So we've seen consumer credit use growing pretty significantly and consumer savings rates, which spiked during the pandemic when, again, the government was mailing out checks, uh, is now down below pre-pandemic levels. This is actually the lowest consumer savings rate we've had in, in several decades. So this is a potential red flag. If you are this, looking this for- This concerns me. Yeah, yeah it, it it concerns me on two levels. One is it could be an indicator that that people at lower income levels are having trouble making ends meet. Uh, and because we're in a high inflationary, high cost of living environment. And, yeah, and I would say just anecdotally, that's got to be true. Yeah. yeah. And they're tapping into their credit cards now in order to make ends meet or they're they're kind of flushing through their their enhanced savings in order to make ends meet. Neither of those is a good scenario. Uh, both of those movies have a really bad ending. The the one thing that is a saving grace so far is while credit use has gone up, we haven't seen credit delinquencies uh, grow grow yet. But that is something to watch. And then the the second part of this that worries me a little bit is there's a group of borrowers out there who bought a house at the market peak with low down payment loans, FHA loans, VA loans, whatever, um, who are now tapping into credit or depleting their savings. That means they're one unexpected expense away from maybe missing that first mortgage payment and getting into a bad cycle. So it, it is something to watch. Uh, we, we have been calling out the FHA portfolio as being one area of vulnerability. Uh, those borrowers tend to have less equity. They tend to have lower cash reserves. They tend to have lower incomes higher debt to income ratios, and they're very vulnerable in a high inter high inflation, uh, high cost of living environment. And, and these, these indicators we're talking about right now with credit use growing and savings declining are, are again, potential red flags. Uh, yeah, they are. You know, Rick, I'm glad you brought this up because like you, I think we are in pretty good agreement, even though I haven't talked to you since the last time you were on the show, which was couple years ago, you know, yep. for sure. But I think we're pretty much in lockstep on our agreement on the housing market. There's not going to be a big crash like everybody's hoping for, or, you know, these clickbait sensationalists are. But the thing that does worry me is the things that are extrinsic to the housing market. It's not the, the makeup of housing and of even affordability, which is a problem, of course, but 
there's just so few distressed owners. That's good. That's all super positive. But it's these other things, the student loan debt, the, the consumer credit. You know, I'm hearing and seeing a lot about the auto industry and the risk of defaults yeah. on automobiles. And then, you know, just look at food prices and, and health insurance costs. And, you know, that stuff is weighing on people, even though the house itself isn't that much of an issue. I, I know to some people listening, they're going to think, oh gosh, it's time to write nasty comments in the remarks section. No, it's not because I'm actually right. And so is Rick. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, go ahead. Now I'll get some really nasty comments. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. yeah the, the auto industry is the only sector of the credit market that is seeing a spike in delinquencies and, and defaults at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I think that's going to get worse because for a long time, my leased car actually went up in value when it was a year old, yep. but that has flipped. Yep. And now the used car market is really adjusted to normality. It's, it, or it's moving toward normality prices because, you down. know, prices are you down. can actually that's buy the, a new car now. There, There's inventory. A little you can find of inventory of both and used car prices are down, I think between three and 4% now on a year over year basis. Yeah which is the first time they've declined in a few years. Um, right. So yeah, you're you're spot on with this. It, it is something to watch. There was a lot of subprime lending going on in the car industry uh, over the last couple of years. And student loans uh, could become an issue if the government ever uh, decides to to allow people to start making payments again. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right now, it's hard to gauge if, it's, if they're a problem or right. not because uh, people haven't been required to make a payment. Yeah. Anyway, all this is, has led, we've been talking about inflation. I just wanted to kind of give people an idea. Even though inflation has declined, and this is good news, uh, the last couple of reports, we're still looking at numbers that are almost at their 40-year highs. The good news is if, if we really have peaked, uh, and I, I may be a lone voice crying in the wilderness on this one, Jason, but I, I believe that if we've peaked for inflation, we may have also peaked in terms of mortgage rates for this cycle. So those yep. those slightly above 7% rates that we saw not too long ago, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't go beyond them because it does feel like we have inflation moving in the right direction. The Fed is has had some dovish language lately that says yep. if the numbers continue to improve, they can stop being as aggressive as they have been. Yeah. So uh, all of this is trending, but it's still hard on households because these numbers are very high. I wanted to share this with you, and, and I hope people can see the far right-hand column of this uh, this chart. The Fed has taken historically aggressive action, unprecedented oh, yeah. Yeah. aggressive. And I, I wanted to show the last time they raised Fed funds rates compared to this time. And you can see back in 2016, they started to raise Fed funds rates in order to get inflation under control. And this is typically how they've done it over the years. It's been step by step by step by step yeah. where they raise things up to where they needed to get them. Uh, and, and then they got inflation under control and they would drop. Uh, the, the 2020 drop was, you know, again, unusual. And that was done because of COVID. You mentioned we really can't look at 2020 as a normal year. But look at how quickly they've raised rates this cycle. Uh, we've never seen seven. We, we rarely seen 75 basis point increases in the Fed funds rate. We've certainly never seen them several months in a row. Uh, and, and even what we just kind of looked at in December is a 50 basis point or a half a point increase uh, in the Fed funds rate. Normally we would have looked at as pretty aggressive and everybody actually sighed in relief. So it, it's, it's led to some things that have never happened before. You and I were talking offline before this. According to Freddie Mac, we've never seen mortgage rates double in a calendar year before. So, so the Fed actions have been unprecedented. They did this because they admitted they, they whiffed on inflation. They waited too long to get started. So they've had to be aggressive in order to, to try and slow down the train. And it's had, it's had two impacts on the market that I wanted to share with your, your viewers, because they're what leads me to believe a recession is much more likely than not based on how things have worked historically. One is... And this might be a little inside baseball for people, so I apologize, but there's something called a yield curve inversion. Uh, and economists follow the, the yields on 10-year U.S. Treasury bonds and two-year U.S. Treasury bonds. And typically, the interest rates, the yields on a 10-year bond are higher than a two-year bond because 
there's more risk involved the longer the investment period. When you have periods with this kind of volatility and, and the market believes you're in for a downturn, those yield spreads reverse, they invert. Uh, and so the, the yields on a two-year become lower than the yields on a 10-year. We've been in one of those markets now for several months. It's actually a pretty significant inversion. And the last seven times this has happened, we've had a recession. So it becomes a, it, it's not something that leads to a recession, but it has been uh, an almost infallible predictor uh, of a recession to come. And we're in one of those periods right now. The other thing, and, and you and I were talking about this as well, and this is uh, this is from the chief economist at Fannie Mae. It's public record data, so I'm not sharing anything proprietary here. But if you look at the last 11 times that the Federal Reserve has raised the, the Fed funds rate to get inflation under control, eight of those times they've had to overcorrect and, and they've steered us into a recession. The thing all eight of those had in common was they waited too long. Inflation got too high or too sticky and they had to get overly aggressive with the Fed funds rates and a recession followed. And those are the same criteria we're looking at in spades this time, Jason. So I and, I am... and, and listeners and viewers, I just want to remind everybody that one of the initial pitches as to why we need a Federal Reserve is to smooth out the economy. <laughs> That's what they told us a little over 100 years ago. We got to smooth out the economy. We have too many cycles. And look at the chart. <laughs> the complete opposite is true. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the Fed has a, a brutally difficult job. They have two main objectives. Fair One enough. is to keep inflation under control and the other is to keep full employment. And and in, in our economy, as things ramp up, uh, you, you tend to run the risk of, of inflation pretty regularly. But yeah. but these two historic trends, Jason, really do lead me to believe that a recession is much more likely than not. Um, you okay. live uh, you live in a cold weather area. I grew up in Pennsylvania, learned to drive. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm Palm Beach, Florida. It's, oh, it's not well, cold. Then, then you're not. But it, I, I believe but, you. But when I woke up to walk the dog this morning, it felt great. It was a brisk 61 degrees. <laughs> so. Well, for, for, for your viewers who are used to or learn to drive in snow and ice like I did in Pennsylvania, you'll learn that there's a, a better way and a worse way to try and stop on a slick road. And, and the, the better way is you tap on the brakes gently and quickly, and you come to a controlled stop and pull off the side of the road. The less good way mm -hmm. is you slam on the brakes and skid into a ditch. Yeah. And unfortunately, the Fed waited too long this time to use the the gentle and rapid uh, decrease move. Uh, and and so now I don't think it's a question of whether or not we skid into a ditch and and hit a recession. It's a question of how deep the ditch is and, and how long it takes us to get out. Uh, I think like that a lot was an excellent metaphor, Rick. That was uh, good. Like, like a lot of the economists yeah. I talked to, I, I, I am of the belief that because all the other economic stuff we talked about is still pretty strong and we wouldn't normally be talking about a recession. Uh, I tend to think this is going to be a fairly short, fairly mild recession. Mm -hmm. uh, and But 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 yeah. nonetheless, uh, a recession, we'll see unemployment go up a little bit. We'll see the economy slow down a little bit, uh, but, but hopefully it won't be a, a terribly taxing uh, recession. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, housing market. Now we talked about the broader economy. Now let's drill down on the actual, the housing market specifically, yeah. Yeah, and you and I were talking about this as well. So we're, we, we've we come up from historically low interest rates uh, to, to double where they were a year ago, um, still near a 20 year high. If you look back over the last 25 years, we're actually in the range of, of what the average mortgage rate was. But I saw a great post on social media not too long ago. It was, it was somebody yelling at at baby boomers basically and said, "Yeah, yeah, I get that you bought your seventy five thousand dollar house with an eighteen percent mortgage. Please leave me alone." Uh, and and we have a, a whole generation of home buyers who's grown up in a low interest rate environment. This has got to be a shock for them, uh, and it's cause sticker shock when when your mortgage rates double. Uh, what the effect has been is if you're looking to buy the same house today you would have bought a year ago, your monthly payment is anywhere from 45 to 60 percent higher. And I don't know about you or your listeners, but I didn't get my 45 percent raise this year. So it's uh, it, yeah. it's a tough market for people to be dealing but, with. But again, that's the wrong comparison because that was the era of anomaly 
It's not a benchmark. If anybody thought that was reality, they are just totally spoiled. Okay, that's not reality. Yeah. And it feels like it feels like the inflection point is somewhere in the five ish percent mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's kind of what at least I'm banking on for next year is let's assume mortgage rates have peaked for this cycle and the Fed can stop being quite so aggressive. That will give the financial markets a chance to uh, kind of stabilize and and mortgage rates to gradually go down over the course of 2023 to where we get down into the fives. Uh, and, and yep. you know, if, if that's the case and if home prices, as we'll see in a moment, appear to be plateauing and wage growth continues to be strong, I can give you a scenario where the market feels a whole lot more affordable toward the second half of next year than it, it's feeling in, in the second half of this year. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Music.